dedication, honesty, loyalty, commitment. These are qualities that define Brigham Young University football. Its great success has focused world attention on a program built on a solid foundation of integrity and hard work. BYU history is filled with stories of courageous efforts, daring deeds, and breathtaking victories. Back to throw, last down, no time on the clock, it's up in the air, it is deep! These are the memories of a proud team and the people who have made it great. These are the greatest moments in BYU football history. One of the greatest moments in Cougar football history took place in 1990. As the season approached, forecasters posted a rare hurricane watch for Provo, Utah. The defending national champions were coming to town. Miami players weren't giving us much respect and most of the country wasn't giving us much respect. So. You know, there was a lot more going into the game riding, riding for us that, you know, we wanted to go in and prove that we were a great team, we could play with the great teams. And the media hype was, uh, was big, and it, it, was, uh, it was a game that, uh, that I was very nervous going into because it had been so hyped up. In front of 65,000 fans and a national television audience, Brigham Young set out to dethrone the national champions. Devlin looking, looking, lots of time. Well, he's still scrambling. He's gonna, now he throws it. Touchdown! What a play by Ty Bentley. Detmer and the Cougars stood tall in the face of Miami's unrelenting pressure. We were running a play called 68 Double Shallow, and I run like a 20-yard corner. As soon as I made my break to the corner, Ty Detmer was drilled by the outside. Uh, well, actually, it was a lineman, a defensive lineman. And Ty was hit so hard, you know, he had to, put, he had to get uh, like 15 stitches in his chin. But before, you know, he was down, he threw the ball to me. You know, so he's, he's a gutsy quarterback. It was obvious BYU would not be blown away by the Hurricanes' reputation. A touchdown strike to Andy Boyce with 10 seconds left in the first half drove that message home. Spurred on by the inspired performance of the Cougar defense, BYU fans performed like a 12th man on the field. The atmosphere was electric. I mean, the intensity, you could feel it. I, mean, you, I think you could have been out in the street outside the stadium and still know that something big was going on. Um, no, it, it was a tight ball game, and I really think the crowd had a lot to do with us winning that game. By the fourth quarter, Miami's heralded quarterback Craig Erickson had been shut down. The Hurricane defense was frustrated, 
and worn out. BYU had won the air war, and in doing so, had won the game. The defending national champions were defeated 28 to 21. BYU had triumphed, and Ty Detmer was on his way to winning the Heisman Trophy. It was a moment to savor, especially for those who were present for the early and not-so-glory-filled days of BYU football. The game of football made a brief appearance at Brigham Young Academy in 1897, but was discontinued shortly thereafter. It didn't get its official start until 1922. For nearly half a century, the Cougars languished in mediocrity. For their first 47 seasons, they averaged less than three victories a year. The favorite phrase was, wait till next year. And uh, we went for years uh, with that. It's kind of not a battle cry, but uh, is our hope. Great moments were few and far between. It took 20 years to record a single victory over arch rival Utah. In 1953, the Cougars suffered a hard-fought 33-32 loss to the Utes, but celebrated their heroic effort by carrying coach Chick Atkinson off the field. Moral victories is what, that's what we survived on for years, just coming close. Moral victories aside, the Cougars won a total of 34 games in the 1950s. By the end of the decade, however, there were some signs of life in the program. Coach Hal Kopp had engineered back-to-back -back winning seasons in 57 and 58. BYU had begun to emerge a little bit as a football entity, it had beaten University of Utah for one of the very few times until that year, and it looked like we had a place to go, we were, we were going someplace. Things were looking up. For the first time in its history, the university had made a real commitment to football. The school's efforts paid off in 1961, when Eldon Forti was honored as BYU's first All-American. Four years later, Virgil Carter became the Cougars' first all-whack quarterback. That same season, BYU trounced New Mexico 42-8 and clinched its first Western Athletic Conference Championship. The decades of disappointment and frustration were finally over. The coach of that first championship team was Tommy Hudspeth. He was a fiery, emotional coach who pointed the Cougars in the right direction. Hudspeth was part of a legacy of great leaders. Men like Eddie Kimball, Tally Stevens, and Hal Mitchell, whose hard work and commitment built BYU's foundation for success. In about 1962, we had an opening on the football staff. I was the offensive backfield coach at that time, and we had an opening, and we were trying to run the old bounds line single wing. And the only guy in the state of Utah that was running an effective single wing was Lavelle Edwards, and he was at Granite High School. Now, that coupled with the fact that Lavelle Edwards is a substantial citizen, a great person, and a good football coach, we found, now here's the guy that can help us be successful. In 1962, BYU's hiring of Lavelle Edwards as an assistant coach hardly made headlines. And 10 years later, 
even when Lavelle was named head football coach, the announcement seemed insignificant. Few realized how radically it would change the course of BYU football history. I hadn't realized it at the time, but I was uh, 42 years of age and had been coaching 18 years and only been associated with four winning seasons in 18. Uh, and then to have them give me the job, I mean, it, uh, it shows you how bad the job was, I guess. But um, BYU uh, had had a, a long history of, of not a lot of success in football. To turn his program around, Lavelle Edwards devised a dramatic new plan. While everyone else in college football ran offenses like the Veer and the Wishbone, BYU installed a drop-back passing game. Sports writers called it folly, but Lavelle was crazy like a fox. Edwards selected a young assistant coach named Dewey Warren to design the new attack. Ironically, in its first season, the new offense produced the nation's leading rusher in Pete Van Valkenburg. In year number two, the Cougars added the dropback quarterback prospect to the roster. He was a Joe Namath clone named Gary Scheide. The aerial attack now had its trigger man. In just two seasons, Shidey rewrote the Brigham Young record book and had the Cougars challenging for a WAC championship. Call it quarterback, she was the most uh, uh, streaky, I guess. I don't know if that's a word or not, but. He would, he would go like uh, four or five in a row and, and not complete a pass. And then he'd hit eight, nine, ten in a row. Uh, he would be absolutely brilliant. Uh, and then he would go cold and, uh, at times. But uh, when he was hot, he was about as good as anybody we've had. After a rocky start in 1974, the Cougar offense began a hot streak of its own. At mid-season, BYU found itself uncharacteristically in the heat of the WAC title hunt. Three straight victories set up a memorable confrontation with perennial power, Arizona State. There was a real feeling that this could be the year. But it would not be easy. The Sun Devil's whack reputation was on the line. In the fourth quarter, the Cougars searched within themselves for something extra and discovered the heart of a champion. Their quest for victory would not be denied. On that day, BYU ended Arizona State's domination of the WAC, 21 to 18. That represented the first re uh, major breakthrough that we had had here in our program since I'd been a head coach. Uh, because from then on, for all intents and purposes, we uh, uh, were going to, uh, we would be the conference champions. Two weeks later, they made their conference title official with a 48 to 20 triumph over Utah. The doormats were now champions. Indeed, a new era had dawned. Nineteen seventy five marked the collegiate debut of Gifford Nielsen. Growing up in Provo, he never wanted to play anywhere else but BYU. I can remember as a young boy 
uh, going over to an old stadium they had over where the uh, where the players practice now and watch football games actually dig a hole in the side of a mountain and sit there it was called the knot hole gang and watch football Gifford's childhood dream of starring for BYU began to fade as he was benched after a lackluster performance in his very first varsity action. Fortunately for him and BYU, he got a second chance. We were losing to New Mexico. We were on the verge of losing our fourth straight game to open up the season. And Coach Edwards, after the first two quarterbacks couldn't get it done, came to me. I was the third string quarterback, and I was right down here on the field. He said, Giff, let's get uh, warmed up and see what you can do again. This time, Gifford got it done, leading the Cougars to a dramatic victory over the Lobos. Improving himself, Nielsen had unveiled the awesome firepower of BYU's offensive arsenal. With Nielsen at the helm, BYU's passing game captured the fancy of the nation's football fanatics. The Cougars took the whack by storm in 1976, winning nine games and their second conference title in three years. Nielsen, who had always looked the part, was officially named All-American. In 1977, Coach Edwards sensed his team's enormous potential. Three lopsided victories propelled the Cougars into the nation's top 20. Gifford Nielsen, who must have been wearing a bright red S on his chest, displayed seemingly superhuman qualities. He was turning the Heisman Trophy race into a runaway. But fate was to play a cruel trick. Just four weeks into his senior season, his career was cut short by a devastating knee injury. The doctor said uh, he's played his last game for him. This knee is, is torn up. I said, and others said, we've seen our last great quarterback for another 20 years. The hopes and dreams of Cougar fans were shattered. Little did they know that the next great arm was already at BYU. Uh, we knew we had a young uh, quarterback at that time. It was going to be pretty good, we thought, a kid named Mark Wilson. And uh, the first game that Mark played after Gifford's injury was against Colorado State. And rather than dropping straight back, we did a lot of play action and rolling out. Uh, Mark Wilson threw seven touchdown passes when we took him out of the game uh, late in the third quarter. And uh, he thought uh, life is pretty easy. The following week, we go to Laramie, and Wyoming had had a very, very mediocre team so far. And Mark threw, I think, five or six interceptions that day, and we hung on to win 10-7. to seven, So. He, had, he was on both ends of the spectrum in the first two games that he played. What Brigham Young fans didn't know was in the one week before Wilson's first start, Lavelle Edwards and quarterback coach Doug Scoville extensively rewrote the offensive playbook. I was an unproven sophomore who'd never played, and this was a quarterback coach who had a tremendous reputation with developing quarterbacks. And I think uh, what people usually do in those situations is say, you're going to do it my way, and if you're not any good at it, I'll get someone that it is. And his approach was entirely different. His approach was, uh, I have a number of things here. Tell me what you like to do and what you're good at, and we'll do those things. And that's exactly what he did. And we stopped doing a lot of things that Gifford did because, frankly, he was better at them than I was. And we focused from that time on on things that I was good at. And consequently, we, we did do well, and I did well, and, uh, and we kept, kept going forward. With Mark Wilson at the controls, the offense never missed a beat. 
future NFL All-Pro Todd Christensen quickly became Wilson's favorite target. During Mark Wilson's era, BYU established itself as the dominant force within the Western Athletic Conference. In 1979, the Cougars hoped to take a big step up in national recognition by playing highly ranked Texas A&M in the season opener. BYU had never beaten a nationally ranked team outside the WAC. They had a lot of players that went and played in the pros, and they had two or three first-round draft picks. So they had a very talented team, and they were justifiably ranked very high, and, and people really didn't know about us, you know, coming from Provo, Utah. Mark Wilson nearly missed the game because of a burst appendix. Instead, he rallied BYU to victory, throwing the winning TD pass with only 52 seconds remaining they would not lose another regular season game that year. Mark Wilson was the All-America quarterback and finished third in the Heisman balloting. His graduation marked the end of the most successful era to date in BYU football history. But unlike the gloomy end of Gifford Nielsen's career, BYU fans look forward to 1980 with great anticipation because a brash but gifted youngster named Jim McMahon was waiting in the wings. In 1980, Cougar fans expected perfection and nearly got it, losing only once. For the first time in its history, BYU won 12 games in a single season. Jim McMahon's performance surpassed all expectations. He shattered 71 NCAA records while winning 25 of the 28 games he started at BYU. He had a great sense for reading uh, coverages and uh, reading defense, defenses. Besides the fact he had a strong arm, but uh, and also his leadership on the field. When he was out there, he was in charge over my, my freshman year. Uh, it was the third game, and he threw a guy, a receiver, off the field. And, uh, you know, I kind of sat there. The receiver kind of looked at him and said, get out of here. He says, you're not catching the ball. Get off the field. Kid, over, I think the kid went in the sidelines and cried. <laughs> but, you know, that was the kind of leader he was. He would just take control, and it was his team out on the football field. By nature, we, 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 we do what the defense allows us to do. I mean, that's philosophically, that's what we, we try to do. He sometimes disregarded the defense. He says, hey, I'm going to make this play happen anyway, because, you know, show me that you're better than I am. And that's what he brought to us. Ironically, the Cougars' success in 1980 put them face to face with their greatest shortcoming, failure to win the Holiday Bowl. BYU disappointed the Western Athletic Conference, losing in the Bowl's first two seasons. In the 1980 Holiday Bowl, the Cougars confronted not only SMU, but a pressure-packed, must-win situation. I, I think of all the games that I've, that I've ever gone to, that game felt more pressure in that one than I did even the national championship game in 84. The Cougars attacked SMU with everything they had. In spite of superlative performances by Jim McMahon and tight end Clay Brown, they were losing the battle. A Craig James touchdown gallop gave the Mustangs an overwhelming 45 to 25 lead with only four minutes to play. The Pony Express left the Cougars for dead. I was ready to go in and put my clothes on. 
and just pack up and leave. I, you know, I was one of those that if I'd have been sitting in the stands during that game, down 20 points or whatever it was, uh, I'd have been, he been, been heading for the exits. On BYU's next possession, still down by 20, they faced fourth and hopeless. I remember asking Doug Scoble when he was standing next to me, I said, what do you want to do? And he said, let's punt. So I sent the punting team in, and, then, and Jim McMahon came off the field, took his helmet off and slammed it down, and was just really, really upset. And uh, I was thinking, well, that, this doesn't make sense to, sense to punt, so I called timeout and uh, called Jim over and told Doug that, we're gonna, that we were going to go for it and, uh, you know, to get... Give Dick, give Jim a play. McMahon got a first down, then a touchdown. The Cougars still have a pulse. With two and a half minutes to play, they trailed by two touchdowns, but the bounces were beginning to go their way. Incredibly, it took only 35 seconds for BYU to score. Like a cat with nine lives, the Cougars had clawed back to within six, but they still needed a miracle, maybe two. Capus, out of Kansas City, gets a kick is blocked! The kick was blocked by Shefflin! Shefflin blocked the kick for Brigham Young, and the Cougars have the ball! Suddenly, the Cougars had a chance, one desperate chance, to pull off the greatest comeback in college football bowl history. Everybody run right to the goal line. All three receivers. Tight end and two wide receivers. Little. Throw it up. Yeah. I think a lot of us were on our knees praying, you know, that maybe something would happen. But uh, I just remember the ball being in the air for 10 minutes. I mean, you know, a 50-yard pass took forever to even come down. Back to throw. Last down. No time on the clock. It's up in the air. It is deep. It is what? He caught it. He it's a touchdown. Touchdown on the last play. And Brigham Young has won it. A terrible catch. If that had been on network, uh, at that time, I think that uh, they would be talking about that like they like they did the Doug Flutie Hail Mary pass against Miami because this one is even much more spectacular than, than that one was. It's often been overlooked that Kirk Gunther's extra point actually provided the narrow margin of victory. Those hardy fans who stayed for the finale not only witnessed one of the greatest moments in BYU football, but took part in one of the most remarkable events in college football history. In 1981, the Cougars found themselves in the midst of the hottest title race in WAC history. The University of Hawaii had upset on its mind when BYU came to Honolulu. A fortunate bounce of the ball kept the Cougars' title hopes alive. As fate would have it, BYU and Utah would meet in Provo the final week of the season to decide the WAC championship. The largest crowd ever to witness a football game in the Beehive State packed Cougar Stadium for this historic confrontation. Never in this long rivalry had BYU and Utah met to decide a championship. This day would belong to the Cougars. Jim McMahon passed for more than 560 yards and set seven NCAA records. The 
56 to 28 triumph had BYU fans packing for another holiday in San Diego. This year, the Cougars took an early lead in the Holiday Bowl and never trailed Washington State, winning their second straight bowl game. At 12 and 1, they were once again flirting with the elite powers in college football. But the McMahon era was over. The experts wondered if Brigham Young's string of record-setting quarterbacks would continue with Steve Young. Some, including Steve himself, questioned whether he was the right quarterback for BYU's future. You always had this, um, I don't know whether it was a hang-up or what, but he, he always felt like that he had to prove to the world that he was, quote, a BYU quarterback. Because uh, I'm sure from his high school coach, from many others, that uh, said you don't want to go to BYU because you're not, you know, a BYU type quarterback. Uh, what you really should do is go somewhere where they want an option quarterback. Brigham Young fans had never seen a quarterback quite like Steve Young. He quickly silenced his critics while bringing a new dimension to the BYU offense. Steve Young was, I think, probably the best athlete that, I, that I've ever coached, been around. He, he's a guy that could play professional football or as a wide receiver. I think he could play as a running back. I think he could play as a defensive back. Steve Young's athletic ability brought a new versatility to the BYU offense, although his running sometimes bothered the receivers. Steve, he was frustrating uh, as far as a receiver goes because he was such a great runner. He'd, he'd drop back, you know, and if, if, if he would uh, make the first read and if it wasn't open, he'd take off running for 50 yards. A couple of times, guys were talking about, you know, peeling back and tackling him <laughs> just because he was running so much. Can you imagine catching the ball? Four, you had four touchdowns already. You've caught 11 passes, and you came back moaning because you're not getting the ball enough. That's, you know, I know it's Kozlowski because that's the way he was. Nick Glenn was never happy, but that's why he's a great player. In 1982, the growing prominence of BYU football was reflected in the expansion of Cougar Stadium to seat more than 65,000 fans. For opponents, Provo had become a tough town to play. The most significant game of 1983 took place in an even larger arena the Rose Bowl, home of the defending Pac-10 champion, UCLA. This whole process of bigger and bigger games through the years started, uh, you know, maybe a couple years before, but that one was a big game because we played in the Rose Bowl in front of the L.A. kind of crowd. It was, we were kind of our coming out, our homecoming type of thing for national media. On that day, the Cougars simply loved L.A., defeating UCLA 37-35. brought Consensus All-America honors for Steve Young and for tight end Gordon Hudson. It also produced an eighth straight WAC championship, another trip to the Holiday Bowl, and another heart-stopping finish. This time, the victim would be the Missouri Tigers. Trailing 17 to 14 with 37 ticks left on the clock, the Cougars faced fourth and 10. Steve Young beat the Missouri Blitz. BYU had a new set of downs, but only 31 seconds to find the end zone. 
The coaches called fake right 28 quarterback screen left, which meant the halfback option pass would be thrown back to Steve Young. When I came out of the timeout, you know, Eddie Sedet ran in and, uh, and gave this play. And I, we never called it. We'd never, we'd practiced it just because it was fun. It was like the last thing, okay, let's do the old throwback and have some fun, you know? And um, I didn't, we were, I don't think anyone's really sure how to even do it. When they called the play, and I told Steve to change it. I said, no way, Steve. I said, change it. So he said, no, that's the play we got to run. I said, I thought we threw it out, you know? And uh, he said, we got to run it. And I said, oh, boy. I said, now it's all up to me. 51,000 plus here. Brigham Young with the ball. First down. That's one play that I didn't know when they called it. Uh, and it wasn't until after it happened that I thought, oh, brother. It's a good thing I didn't know because that would have probably gone out of my mind. Back to throw, play flicker. It's headed for Young. At the 15. At the 10. At the 5. He's gone. Oh! Touchdown. I can remember Coach Chow calling the play and, you know, putting my hands in my face and going, what are we doing? You know, something like this. And, then after the play was over and we'd scored, you know, patting him on the back, saying what a great call it was. Uh, I, I basically handed off and Eddie ran over and I was kind of like trying to find him and there was a bunch of people and I couldn't see him and I just kind of wandered around over there hoping that something would happen. All of a sudden the ball flies up and uh, it's going to get intercepted. You know, this guy was waiting on it, you know, and somehow he misses it and because I thought he was going to hit it, uh, I catch kind of the back end of it barely and uh, run it in. I mean, it was... I don't know how, uh, Norm will tell you it was just, you know, divine intervention, you know, this call, I felt it, you know. Eh, you know, I think it was just, we were desperate. <laughs> this great moment provided the exclamation point, marking the end of Young's career, and left BYU fans believing they'd never experience anything to top this. Whether it's a miracle victory or a disappointing defeat, Lavelle Edwards' outward demeanor remains constant. Everyone sees him on the sidelines and he's just, he's got that, you know, that slouch in it, you know, like he doesn't, and he's very intense and a really funny guy. He's actually pretty humorous. Uh, he's had dry humor. And uh, a lot of times, you know, for a while there, I didn't catch on to a lot of his jokes. I read somewhere where someone once said that I'm actually a happy guy, I just had never told my face. And uh, I guess that's uh, probably true. The Lavelle Edwards era has become the golden era of BYU football. In this most traditional of schools, a sense of pride in its team's success has extended through all facets of the university. In September of 1984, the campus community wondered if this golden era of excellence would continue. For the first time in years, the Cougars' prospectus was filled with question marks. The season opened in Pittsburgh, featuring a no-name squad playing number three ranked Pitt in the first college football game ever broadcast live on ESPN. Do you remember they're warming up? I looked up in the sky and I see the, the Goodyear blimp. And I looked over to, uh, to one of my teammates and I go, no, this is big time. Junior quarterback Robbie Bosco was making his first start, trying to fill the shoes of the legends who preceded him. He got off to a rocky start, but never backed off. As if he were cut from the same cloth as Nielsen, Wilson, McMahon, and Young, Bosco took all that Pitt could dish out. 
With less than two minutes to play, BYU trailed by five. Bosco. Bosco down the middle. Then he's got Haysburg down there. Haysburg's got it. He's going to score. Touchdown for Brigham Young. Bosco to Hayward explodes with a minute 37 seconds to go. And Brigham Young from Provo has come back to finally take the lead. What an exciting game to start it for ESPN. In the tradition of the Miracle Bowl of 1980, the Cougars had done it again. Only this time, it was in September, against an Eastern power ranked number three in the nation. Maybe this team had a future. We were fired up about it, and I think going into spring ball, we all felt like we had a special team and we had a chance at a national championship just because of our schedule. We started talking national championship from the beginning. Uh, you know, within the team meetings, the players by themselves. And, uh, and I think if Coach Edwards heard that, he probably would have said, come on, guys, you know, wake up. This is a reality. While the offense provides the thrills, they say defense wins championships. It was no secret that the Cougars' traditionally strong defense enabled BYU to play a wide-open offense. Throughout the 1984 season, it allowed opponents less than 14 points per game and shut them down cold when the game was on the line. All-American defensive back Kyle Morrell, number five, made the greatest one-on-one -on -one defensive play in BYU history in a game-saving goal line stand against Hawaii. I, every time I see it, it's unbelievable. And it's like he said, he said, what difference does it make if I was offside? Because you couldn't have gotten any closer than they were anyway. And uh, it was just one of those instinctive things that I've never seen him try it since. Uh, Never seen anybody try it since, but it was just one of those spur of the moment decisions that he made and, and it timed out perfectly. He could not have practiced it and timed it out any, any better than, than the way it went. Week after week, the Cougar string of victories grew. The Cougars had not lost a game since the first week of 1983. One could sense a special chemistry within this team. After our team meetings, with the coaches gone, the players would always get together and, and huddle up. And, uh, some would either give a prayer or someone would give sort of an inspirational little speech or something like that. And then as the year went on, we, we said, hey, it's not just us, it's the coaches too. This is about four or five games left. And the togetherness that we had on that team was tremendous. But up until then, I never saw that in the BYU football team. Undefeated and untied. It was only a matter of time before BYU was ranked number one. Ironically, it happened after a victory over Utah. We were ranked third. South Carolina was second, and Nebraska was first. Uh, we heard during the game that Navy in the monumental upset had beaten South Carolina. And then, as we were finishing the post-game radio show, and whatever got word that, that Nebraska, or Oklahoma had upset Nebraska, stopped them on the one yard line or something. And that meant now that we were the only undefeated team left in the country. After a perfect season, BYU was voted number one, but outside of Provo, got little respect. When the Cougars took the field against Michigan in the 1984 Holiday Bowl, there was still plenty to prove. The nation wouldn't accept the idea of a whack team playing for the national championship. The Cougars scored early, but suddenly their dream of a championship had turned into a nightmare. Robbie Bosco was carried from the field. 
a knee injury appeared serious. The doctor came up to me and told me that uh, he had checked Robbie and that uh, it wasn't quite as se severe as they thought, but they had, they had virtually put his leg into a cast. In other words, it had felt splints on it and had it taped up to where, and then a knee brace to where he couldn't, couldn't he hardly, like he was stiff-legged. And he said he won't be very mobile, but at least he's not going to hurt the leg. And he said if he, if he can function, then of course you can go ahead and play him. The game meant so much, not only to the team, but to uh, just BYU football. And uh, it meant a lot to me. Um, I didn't want to just give up. I wasn't going to let that stop me from helping us have a chance to be number one. While Bosco's return provided some encouragement, it did little to stimulate the sleepwalking Cougars. It wasn't until BYU trailed 17 to 10 in the fourth quarter that they got their wake-up call. We knew we weren't playing very well, and we knew that we were blowing our own chances to become number one. And we just kind of had to regroup, get ourselves together, and, uh, and you know, go down and do the job. A leaping catch by Glenn Kozlowski tied the score at 17. The Cougars were one drive away from a national championship. We got in a huddle and everybody kind of looked at each other and, and uh, Robbie just said, hey, you know, we, this is it, guys. And uh, one of our team captains, who was uh, Craig Garrick, uh, kind of looked at everybody and says, guys, you know, this is what we've tried for all year. Let's, let's go get it. It took Robbie Bosco less than two minutes to drive the length of the field and set up the winning touchdown. Finally got down about a third and three, third and four call on about the 15 yard line. As I came back, our main receiver is Kelly Smith. And as he comes out, he's being covered. And then they start putting a big rush on the outside, so I kind of step up in the pocket. I saw Robbie scramble, so I took off running towards him, and then I saw Kelly Smith, who caught the winning touchdown, running down the sideline by himself. And I say, I say to myself, please, Rob, see him throw the ball. Scramble, throws it. In what must be considered the greatest moment in BYU football history, Brigham Young's 1984 National Championship was the ultimate achievement of a program dedicated to excellence and integrity. It was a perfect season and the perfect tribute to all those who struggled for so long to make it possible. Everybody would say uh, that BYU is somewhat of a unique place. You know, it isn't like every college. It's not like every campus. I mean, there's a different feeling when you're on campus there. Uh, I just think it's a special place to go and spend four years. I can't think of a better place. If I had to do it over again, I would uh, make the same decision. You look up and there's 65,000 people uh, cheering. You know, you look over and you got cheerleaders. Uh, where you run between them and, and the band, you know, they're playing, and that's a great feeling. And you look up to the right side, and there are the mountains there, you know, past the stands. Uh, you breathe a little bit of that fresh air there. <laughs> championship opened new doors of opportunity for BYU football. In 1985, the Cougars were selected to play in the kickoff classic 
where they scored a decisive victory over Cotton Bowl champion Boston College, winning an unprecedented 25th straight football game. Ten consecutive WAC titles and increased national visibility brought well-deserved recognition for the talents of BYU athletes. In 1986, defensive tackle number 99, Jason Buck, became the first BYU player ever to win the Outland Trophy, presented to the outstanding interior lineman in all of college football. In 1989, offensive lineman Mo Elawanibi won the Outland as well. Despite the amazing record of BYU quarterbacks, none had ever won the Heisman Trophy. It took a fair-haired kid from Texas, one with a slingshot arm and the heart of a lion, to claim the most prestigious award in all of college football. His name was Ty Detmer. Ty was one of those kids, just like Jim McMahon. If he wasn't out there two or three days, then Norm Chow came in one day and told me that we're back in the quarterback business. From the beginning, Detmer had a flair for the dramatic. His appearance in a game was like a shot of adrenaline for the BYU offense. He seemingly played with a sixth sense that enabled him to instantly identify and exploit a defense's Achilles heel. Ty Detmer understands what he wants to accomplish in this offense. He knows that he's not supposed to get greedy. He's supposed to take what a defense will give him, be happy with that, but then when the opportunity comes to strike, you hit it, and you hit it big. They always say the great quarterbacks have that intangible quality about them. Like, you know, Joe Montana, there's, there's something about them that makes them go that extra mile. There's something inside them that makes them, that makes them different from everybody else, that makes them better, that will make them reach for that extra inch. And I don't know what that is. I can't pinpoint what that is, but Ty Detmer has that. And some people have the heart. I mean, he's a heart as big as a house. He'll die out there before he gets off the field. Despite his boyish looks, Detmer was the ultimate field general. Most of the quarterbacks that I've been associated with here and, and the ones before Mark Wilson, Gifford Nielsen, Bosco, Young, McMahon, you know, they all seem kind of quiet off the field, but yet when you get on the field, the quarterback's got to be the guy to take control and, and maybe, you know, give a pep talk in the huddle or something, you know, and I think every good quarterback has the ability to do that. In 1990, he passed for more than 5,000 yards, becoming the most prolific passer in NCAA history. On December 1st, 1990, he received fitting recognition of his heroic deeds, joining legends like Dope Walker, Roger Staubach and Marcus Allen as a recipient of the Heisman Trophy. It was truly another great moment in BYU football history. The Mormon Church and Brigham Young University provide the foundation for a football program that puts integrity before victory and 
stands committed to enriching the lives of the young men who become part of the BYU tradition. Sports are a lot like life. You're judged in life by how successful you are. And in sports, you're judged by your success on the field. And a lot of it is discipline. A lot of it is hard work and, and uh, effort and you know, never giving up. And it's the same things that you can carry over into business and everything else. I know without uh, you know, our Father in Heaven's help, I wouldn't be here. And in return, I'm going to do the best I can to help others. Lavelle is the guy that runs the show. And you can talk about all the different people who have come through here. He's the only constant. And uh, uh, he's the only constant for the last 20 years. And it's always the same feeling. People come in from all walks of life. And he takes them all, and everyone leaves feeling like, well, Lavelle's like, he's like my dad. And he makes me feel good, and he makes me play great football. As Lavelle Edwards enters his third decade as head coach, the program continues to flourish and will provide countless more great moments in BYU football history. Greatest Moments in BYU Football History is brought to you by the Granite Furniture Superstores, the other home team.